JBS presents a television exclusive, The Der Show with Alan Dershowitz. Welcome to today's Der Show. We have a very, very special guest today, a hero, a man who has stood up for civil rights and civil liberties. And then when he stood up for the constitutional rights of Donald Trump, former President Donald Trump, somehow he began to lose some of his hero status in the eyes of at least some who don't understand the role of lawyers and constitutional lawyers. David Schoen uh, transformed uh, the South in many ways. He was a civil rights lawyer during the golden age of civil rights and civil liberties, and his work was recognized by the American Bar Association, awarding him his pro bono publico award for his great work in the South. He's also been a very successful criminal defense lawyer and generally a, a do-gooder and the kind of person who would get awards and be invited by groups regardless of politics. I have no idea what David's politics are. I couldn't care less. Um, but when he was asked to stand up for the Constitution and to defend the rights of Mr. Donald Trump, citizen Donald Trump, not to be tried after he left office for speeches that were covered by the First Amendment, he accepted that role knowing full well that it would not be easy on him or his family. I know because I spoke to him about it and uh, we discussed uh, what happened to me and my family and my friendship. But heroically, he put partisanship uh, and politics and personal issues aside and uh, became kind of the leader of the uh, Trump defense team uh, during the first day of argument. Uh, he really uh, retrieved what could have been uh, a very negative day for the Trump team and, and delivered a brilliant, brilliant opening argument on the um, uh, criteria for impeachment and on the fact that the framers of the Constitution never intended impeachment to apply to somebody who was no longer serving in office. So um, I've asked him to come on our show, uh, The Der Show, to explain his role to describe what's happened to him since and to talk about the future going forward and how we combat, combat the kind of legal, legal bar association McCarthyism that um, we're all experiencing now in this country, especially those of us who had anything to do with defending uh, either President Trump or former President Trump. So, David, welcome to The Der Show. It's great to have you as a guest. Well, it's an honor to be a guest, but I have to say, uh, hearing those words from you, uh, mean more than I can describe. You've been my hero since even before I wanted to become a lawyer. And uh, as I mentioned before, I have every book you've ever written on my bookshelf. And I stole your arguments from my arguments on jurisdiction. So, um, and the last thing I want to say on this point is, I think it's very, very important. One of the many things that I've had in mind about you since before I became a lawyer and during the course of the time I've been a lawyer is your position on the right to counsel. Um, you have stood solidly and consistently on both the right to counsel and a lawyer's obligation to take on some unpopular cases. I've always had that in mind uh, my entire life. And that's why, by the way, you know, I've done things like representing the Ku Klux Klan um, when certainly I don't subscribe to their position on any issues. And I don't think they'd welcome you as a member. Uh, certainly uh, uh, probably wouldn't give you a sheet. They'd probably try to wrap you in a sheet. Uh, but you defended them the way I defended the rights of Nazis to march through Skokie, Illinois, where many Holocaust survivors were terrorized, terrorized by their speech. But you and I both know that if the Nazis are prevented from marching through Skokie, that Martha, Martin Luther King would have been prevented from mar marching through Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, you can have free speech for me, but uh, not for thee. Um, the role of counsel is being uh, challenged uh, today. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, many of my friends who had no problem with me representing Nazis in Skokie are defending their right and defending other terrible, terrible people, another neo-Nazi from Illinois, and no problem with that. But defending President Trump's rights, that broke friendships. That ended 25-year friendships because they couldn't understand that. Now bar associations are going after 
of people. The Harvard Law School uh, has a petition circulating today. Hundreds of students, fortunately not yet any faculty as far as I can tell, uh, saying that people who were in any way associated with the Trump administration, uh, I think it would include us, but certainly include anybody who was in the White House Counsel's Office or who was in the White House, uh, would not be welcome at Harvard. They can't speak there. They can't teach there. Um, they're, they're, they, who knows if they'd be admitted even as students. So, you know, we're living through this horrible period of McCarthyism. You're not old enough to remember the real McCarthyism, but I was the president of the student body at Brooklyn College when I was fighting against McCarthyism, even though I hated communism as much as I hated McCarthyism, but that wasn't the issue. So, so tell me what it was like. Give us just a little bit of a personal sense of what it was like. I know you spoke to uh, former President Trump two or three or four times a day. Did he try to tell you what to say? What kind of a client was he? I don't know. He was a terrific client. You know, all I knew about him beforehand was this public persona that I had heard and read about. He was as gracious as any client I have ever had in every conversation I had with him. Nothing but supportive, never tried to force any agenda. And that story about the that he was trying to force election fraud agenda on the South Carolina lawyers simply wasn't true. They were a fine group of folks, a nice, guy, nice guys, good lawyers. But that wasn't uh, what the falling out was about. Um, no, he was a terrific client. Every time I spoke to him, he just built me up, built up my confidence. And he said to me, I chose you to be lead counsel in this case for a reason. You have to be assertive, though, with the team and that sort of thing. That's not my personality. So um, I, I, wasn't, I, I may have let him down in that regard a bit in terms of organizing things. But I tried to do my best in my presentation that I possibly could for him as the client. And, uh, and I thought for the senators there, the Republican senators needed some backing up. And I think, quite frankly, without being uh, too presumptuous, for the Constitution. Um, and again, I honestly was relying on a lot of materials that I read that you wrote. Um, I, I hate to say this again, but um, the fact that it's Alan Dershowitz standing up for these positions cannot be underestimated. You have suffered great personal loss of friendships and that sort of thing. But beyond that, it's your name and the reputation you built for integrity and for knowing what you're talking about that stands by itself, really stands alone in this country. Well, I appreciate that because a lot of my friends and even some relatives say I've changed. Uh, they don't understand, as you do, that I've been making these arguments for 55 years, more, 60 years, some of them. I haven't changed at all. I mean, the one rap I plead guilty to is... Uh, Consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds, as Ralph Waldo Emerson once right. said. And I may have a small mind because I've been consistent. I have defended the right of counsel, the right to dissent, the right of free expression. Since I'm a high school debater, uh, I went to Brooklyn Talmudical Academy where everybody was a debater. We debated the Talmud in the morning and in the afternoon we debated capital punishment and uh, admission of China to the United Nations. So uh, I've been debating and I've been representing unpopular clients since the beginning of my career, half of them on a pro bono uh, basis. The, the problem, and, and you have been a great uh, civil rights lawyer, and suddenly you're being disinvited. Uh, you're no longer part of a civil rights or civil liberties group that you were part of. Tell us about that. Yeah, that, that hurt a bit. Um, the problem is, you know, by the way, you spoiled me because I thought if a person is at the pinnacle of the profession feels that way, that must filter down and other people pick that up. But you've been the one voice that's solid with that. Uh, with this listserv, I belong to a listserv of of, other than me, very prominent civil rights lawyers in the country. And I get a great deal out of it. We exchange ideas. And I, con I always have, you know, three or four or more civil rights cases going. Right now, I have a very important police shooting case. A uh, victim was a fellow named Jermaine McBean uh, down in Florida, shot and killed by Broward County Sheriff's Office. We exchange ideas on this list. So when I took on this representation, all of a sudden I saw that I had an email from the president of the, of the list. I had never heard from her before. So I tried to sort of make it easier for them. And I said, I assume you're writing. I didn't read the email. I said, I assume you're writing to me because of this representation. If this makes people uncomfortable, I would withdraw from the list. Well, I came to find out that she, she said to me later, they had, she had spent 48 hours discussing with the board and other people about what to do about me and that they ultimately had decided to suspend me and that that's why she was contacting me. I felt very bad about that. I, I, again, I was willing to withdraw from it, so I don't want to make people feel comfortable, uncomfortable. 
The same thing happened with the well, teaching position. But that's the I big did. difference between us. I want to make people feel uncomfortable. That's part of my job. Yeah. I would never have withdrawn from a list like that. I would have made it public. I would have embarrassed them. I would have attacked them and gone after them. Uh, why don't you? Why don't I mean, you're just too nice a guy to be uh, a civil liberties, civil rights and, and, and lawyer for the Constitution. You know, why not fight back? I'll help you. I know. I, I don't know. I just they're, they're very nice folks. And I have to tell you, they also helped me through a, a personal period. I don't know them well, but I was going through in, in December. Uh, my whole family got devastated by the covid virus and my mother passed away. And she was the best friend oh, of, so sorry. of my family, my next door neighbor. And they kind of helped me through that list. But I, all of my friends did. Anyway, I, I don't for me, at least it's just not my thing to expose it. But I have to say the same thing happened with uh, law school. I have been wanting very much to teach a course in civil rights law um, just because I feel strongly about the issues and I love teaching. I love being around students, the intellectual curiosity, that sort of thing. So I've been discussing with the law school uh, about crafting a civil rights course for the fall. And uh, while I had no guarantee, we were very close and they had said to me, I think this is going to work out. So again, when this thing came up, I contacted the fellow I had been speaking to and he wrote back and said, I appreciate the email. It is true that students and faculty, some students and faculty, would be uncomfortable if you were on campus teaching. So that fell through. And, yeah, uh, I, it hurts I, I'm also. curious. I wonder what would have happened if I had remained on as a teacher. You know, six years ago, I retired from Harvard after 50 years of teaching. And I'm sure there would have been student protests against me, uh, but I wouldn't have backed away. I would have taught the course. If nobody showed up, I would have taught it to an empty room. If two students showed up, I would have taught it to students. Uh, uh, not so long ago, I was invited to speak at Harvard Law School um, uh, and um, a, a, in person. It was before, before the pandemic. And, um, and I agreed. And the sponsors finally decided they had to move the speech off campus uh, because there had been threats that I would be shouted down and silenced. And we had to move the speech a few blocks away from campus where there were no uh, protests. So this is somebody who had tenure and taught for 50 years. And I know I'd be protested. There has been a movement to try to rescind my emeritus professorship. Of course, I would you know, take him to court if they tried to do it. But uh, but why? I mean, y you and I are different than a lot of others because we're the nightmare of the uh, anti-Trump zealots because we're both civil liberties lawyers, we're civil rights lawyers, we're on the right side of many of the issues, the same side of many of the issues as many of the people who are opposing us are on. And so it's easy for them to attack Rudy Giuliani. It's easy for them to attack uh, some of the other uh, people who don't have the kind of reputation for civil liberties defense that we have, but we make their lives very uncomfortable. And so we become the pariahs and the enemies and they have to come up with arguments. In my case, I've been bought off. It must be that the president had something on me through Jeffrey Epstein and used it to extort me to become his lawyer. I mean, every fantasy, every you name it, every conspiracy theory um, um, came up. I was offered millions of dollars to do it. Uh, I, I contributed my fee to charity. Uh, but any effort to attack me um, was directed because they couldn't just dismiss me as another right-wing extremist who is defending Donald Trump. And I think the same thing is true with you. And I don't think you can see objectively from the distance how important it is that Alan Dershowitz has continued to stand up every single day on personal and professional attacks. That's what allows me to do what I'm doing, by the way. Uh, I don't know that you can see that objectively, but how dare they try to cancel you? You literally wrote the book on these civil liberties that attend criminal defense practice and civil rights practice. You wrote the book. You taught them about it all. I, you gave a talk the other day that I think was very interesting. I don't like labels at all, liberal, conservative, all of that business. But you spoke about how what's called liberalism has changed. And you know, I saw Floyd Abrams wrote a piece in The Soul of the First Amendment that it's actually folks who are thought of as liberals now who are really see the First Amendment as an enemy, sort of curtailing free speech, this cancel culture. Some things just can't be talked about because they're offensive, they think. They've abandoned the idea of the marketplace of ideas which it has a good in and of itself. And so, I, you know, again, how dare they suggest that they can label you as yeah. either liberal or conservative? You wrote the labels. 
Well, but they they still do. And, you know, you're right. I wrote a book called The Case for Liberalism. My new book, which will be out in a few weeks, is called The Case Against the New Censors, um, How to Combat the Censorship of the High-Tech uh, progressives and universities because we have you know it's much harder to fight against people who we admire some of them are our family members or our friends it's very it was easy to fight against mccarthyism they were the bad guys we were the good guys but today a lot of the censors are people who we have long regarded as good guys and that's much much harder to fight against kind of benevolent censorship but let let's turn to your defense i thought you 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 had one job to do just one job as a lawyer your job was not to lose more than seven eight or nine republican senators on any theory and i thought you guys made an extraordinarily effective argument when you said to them they don't have jurisdiction they don't have jurisdiction over a former president even if the senate said they do even if the senate voted by a majority that is not the law of the case that is not binding on the senators and you opposed um, uh, uh, the manager's argument the, the managers actually made the argument at one point uh, jamie raskin said to the senators you're bound it's like you made a motion to dismiss and it failed, and you responded to that and basically said, no, you have the right to vote your conscience. You can vote to acquit because the Senate has no jurisdiction. You can vote to acquit because the speeches were covered by the First Amendment. You can vote to acquit because there was a violation of due process. It, it doesn't matter. You have the untrammeled authority to vote to acquit on any constitutionally permissible ground. And I think that carried the day. And you got... Uh, only seven Republican senators uh, who voted against you and 43 who voted in your favor. And that became an overwhelming victory under the two thirds. Was that your strategy going in? Absolutely. And you're 100 percent right. We don't use precedent by some political action by a previous Senate. They tried to use the Belknap case, and all of that. It provides some sort of historical guidance, but it's not a binding precedent. And you're 100 percent right. Listen, the House managers took such a radical position in this case, far more than they had to take their position in their brief. And as articulated in the thing in the so-called trial was that any person who ever serves as a civil officer at any time in the government right. can be impeached and barred from future office any time in perpetuity. So, for example, if you had an ultra right wing uh, Congress all of a sudden and they said, you know, this guy, Abe Lincoln, had it wrong. About slavery. Slavery actually was a good thing. He ruined our country and what he did. They can impeach Abe Lincoln today. Or more realistically, perhaps, um, Eric Holder served as a civil officer over the Fast and Furious, President Obama over Benghazi, whatever it is, depending on who's sitting there, that's the political weaponization partisanship that ruined, in my view, tore to shreds the constitutional impeachment process in this case. They could have taken a modified position like well, since he was impeached while he was still in office, you can conduct the trial. That still would have been wrong because removal is what we think of for impeachment. But That's they went right. far beyond that. I don't know why they did. Uh, you know, Jamie Raskin is a smart guy, as you probably know. I represented his father back in the late 1960s, Marcus Raskin, who was himself charged with kind of uh, incitement to uh, uh, violence or insurrection for opposing the draft and then the Pentagon Papers case. And he won both of those cases on a broad view of the First Amendment. But uh, Raskin has become a uh, very partisan. And I think the briefs were not good briefs uh, because, as you say, they overstated their argument. They said there's, quote, no temporal limitation, no time limitation, no statute of limitations. You can go back in time and simply convict in order to prevent somebody from uh, serving in the future. Nikki Haley, if she becomes a prominent uh, candidate for president, could be impeached for what she did at the U.N. Hillary Clinton could be impeached. I guess I could be impeached. I once served in the federal government as a law clerk on the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals. I guess. I don't know whether I qualify for impeachment. What an honor that would be. But uh, um, th they went so far. And then they got those 144 scholars uh, to write that absurd brief, which basically threatened you and basically said to you, David Schoen, we don't care what you believe about the First Amendment, but if you dare to raise a First Amendment defense, you can be disbarred for raising a legally frivolous argument, and you'll never teach at a university because we have concluded that a First Amendment argument 
is unscholarly, unreasonable, unjuristic, and all of the things that would disqualify you from teaching at a university. What did you think when you saw that letter? It's quite intimidating, but you know who stood up? Alan Dershowitz wrote a piece directly confronting them and exposing the absolute absurdity of their argument and a defense, Alan Dershowitz wrote, a defense of the First Amendment that had to be made. And by the way, as to your previous point, so really, so that people know what this, what they would su suggesting with their argument is that any formal civil officer should be go, they go, go after them without any of the safeguards of the criminal justice system or any even civil litigation safeguards. That is, they can use this impeachment process, which has no rules of evidence, no questions about admissibility, um, no due process. And they can just use that if they target some former civil officer the same way that ordinarily we could do in the criminal justice system, but without any of the safeguards. It's absolutely well, un-American. Well, a perfect example of that regard. was their the last minute danger, effort to call as a witness a classic hearsay witness, a member of Congress who said she heard from another member of Congress who heard from the president. And uh, in the end, uh, you, you did the right thing, I think, and that is stipulated to the admissibility as hearsay instead of opening the door to many witnesses. To me, the most disappointing part of that 144 scholars, 143 of them didn't bother me. It's the fact that Floyd Abrams joined yeah, that. Absolutely I was right. shocked. Uh, here is a man who I admire enormously. I worked with him together on the Pentagon Papers case. He represented uh, the New York Times. I represented Senator Gravel, who read the Pentagon Papers uh, on the floor of the Senate. Um, I've admired him. I like him personally. Uh, he's one of the nicest people and one of the best lawyers I know. I haven't had a chance to have a one-on-one -on -one private conversation with him as to why he felt comfortable signing a letter that, to me, undercut the First Amendment. I suspect his views were that the speech itself was protected by Brandenburg, but I suspect he must take the view that the First Amendment doesn't apply in impeachment proceedings. Uh, I think that's wrong, but I sure hope he didn't take the view that the speech itself, peacefully and patriotically, have your voices heard, would not be protected by the Brandenburg principle. What do you think? I, I, I have to hope and think that you're right. I still think he's wrong, and I hesitate to say Floyd Abrams is wrong. I'm afraid that a political agenda has uh, really made some of these folks go crazy. But the other position that I hope he doesn't endorse that Jamie Ra uh, Congressman Raskin took is that crazy position. The first the president of the United States has no First Amendment right, and he's treated as if some lower level uh, unelected civil employee and all that. That was an outrageous position that he took. And I, I think it's demeaning. It's, uh, it demeans himself, but it's also offensive to the American public to hear that kind of argument from a guy who constantly stood up and said, I'm a constitutional law professor, I'm a constitutional law professor. That the argument he made has no support whatsoever in any body of constitutional law. No, you're of course right. Uh, Jamie Raskin was my student. He was a good student. I liked him. I contributed, I think, to his first campaign for Congress. But to make that kind of an argument, you know, the argument was that because a low level official can be fired for making racist statements. Therefore, the president can be fired. Well, you don't fire the president. This is not the British parliamentary system where you can fire the prime minister based simply on a vote of no confidence. The framers eliminated maladministration as a ground specifically for impeachment and introduced these four elements, treason, bribery, other high crimes and misdemeanors. That's not firing somebody. And so the idea that a president loses his First Amendment rights, first of all, it's not only the president has the First Amendment right, it's everybody who wants to listen to the president. Exactly. I have a First Amendment right to hear what the president has to say. And you can't deny me my hearing right under the First Amendment, which is just as important as his speaking right. And so the First Amendment is kind of interactional. He speaks, I listen. I speak, he listens. That's what is in the nature of conversations. I have an article that I'm writing now about the Harvard uh, um, uh, uh, petition uh, and the idea that Students at Harvard will not be able to hear what 70 million Americans think. Those arguments are no longer allowed on a university campus. I don't agree with those arguments. I, I'm not a Republican. I'm not a conservative. I'm not a Trump supporter politically. But I want to hear what 70 million Americans think. If I'm going to go out and practice law, 
I can't be ready to practice when I only heard what some Americans think and what other Americans don't think. My jurors will consist of Trump supporters. My judges will consist of judges appointed by Trump. How can law schools prevent that point of view from being heard on a campus? I'm, it's shocking, among, and now they want to prevent I'm, your point of view from being heard. Among many other things, that's one of the most important things you've said, I'll say today. But uh, you say so many important things. That was the worth a law school class right there, what you said. It's so important. You know, we see this thing. I do a lot of ballot access cases. For example, in 2020, I represented a socialist candidate for president, Gloria Lariva, to get her on the D.C. ballot. Now, I'm not a socialist. I don't subscribe to her views. That has nothing whatsoever to do with it. But the, course, this other course. half of the equation that people forget, the right of voters to cast their vote for her, the right of voters or supporters or non-supporters to hear her socialist point of view, that's an important constitutional right, too. And that's mm -hmm. sort of an analog of what we're talking about here. I, I know I agree. Can I ask you a personal question? I was so thrilled and felt such a warm spot in my heart when every time you drank some yeah. water, you put your hand on your head. Because I don't know how many of my viewers and listeners understand that, but like you, I grew up, I grew up Orthodox, and you couldn't drink water without having your head covered uh, with a yarmulke, a kippah. And you weren't wearing a kippah, but every time you drank the water, you either instinctively or in a planned way put your hand on your head to create the separation between you and God, which is what the yarmulke, at least one of the purposes, the yarmulke is supposed to uh, serve. Was that something that you thought about, or did it just come instinctively? It just came instinctively, and it became so awkward to be reading about this thing that you're right. I mean, I went in there. I made a decision not to wear my yarmulke. I've always struggled with this sort of thing. I wear it in a courtroom when I'm arguing a motion. It's just the judge. I don't wear it in front of a jury, particularly because of a very bad experience I saw shortly after Crown Heights. I sat at a table with some religious Jews, and it became a factor. One of the jurors said, don't worry about whether they're guilty or innocent. You know it's the Jews that bring the drugs into our community. We should convict them. And I, I was sensitive then that my wearing a yarmulke may inure to the client's detriment. People draw stereotypes. So here was a setting I'd never been in before. I thought the easiest thing is not to wear it, not to draw attention to it. But I didn't intend to drink. I think because of the, this COVID business, I was very thirsty all the time. And so as I was speaking, I had to drink. It occurred to me I didn't have my yarmulke. So just very sort of, I thought casually, covered my head, thinking every time I make a blessing or if I'm drinking or eating, I think about God's presence above me and that sort of thing. That's what the yarmulke symbolizes to me. So I did it just instinctively. And then I started reading about People, but I'll tell you an interesting thing. People were making comments. I heard, I don't follow social media, but people were making comments. My kids told me uh, negative comments. And then someone would chime in, do you understand it's a religious thing? And then they backed off. I spoke to leader Schumer about it to thank him for his consideration on the Shabbos issue. And he said, well, you know what my name is, don't you? I said, I really don't. Maybe Shomer. He said, that's right. That's my name. And I explained to the other senators what you were doing when you covered your head uh, with that. So that was a nice thing. You'll you'll enjoy this story. This is a wonderful story. So I'm a law clerk on the Supreme Court, and a woman um, who is a very orthodox Jew comes to argue a case on behalf of New York State. Uh, she's now a professor, maybe retired at uh, at uh, uh, I think Cardoza, a law school. Very orthodox Jew. I'm sitting in Justice Goldberg's chambers, and I get a note from Justice Goldberg saying, "Alan, the Chief Justice wants to know." whether Jewish law requires a woman to wear a hat in the courtroom because hats are prohibited in the courtroom. So I wrote back saying, yes, Jewish law does require a married woman at least to wear, have her head covered. He passed it on to the chief justice and the chief justice fine allowed her to do it. And then he passed the woman a note. Um, her name is Malvina Halberstam. I don't know if you know her. Very, very brilliant lawyer. Passes Malvina a note saying, please come to my chambers after the argument. I want to speak to you. And so after the argument, she comes to Justice Goldberg's chambers. Goldberg invites me in and uh, and and explains that I had uh, written the 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 response, essentially, that allowed her to wear the hat. And Justice Goldberg then turned to her and said, whenever you come back to our courtroom, don't ever hesitate to wear a hat. But, she said, he said, do me a favor, wear something a little bit more discreet than that very large <laughs> leopard skin hat that you're wearing. <laughs> so from now on, when she came back to the court, she always wore a very discreet hat. But look, 
religious uh, freedom is part of our Constitution. The Supreme Court wrote a terrible decision many years ago involving not being able to wear a yarmulke when you're a witness in a case. And it was an awful decision written by Chief Justice Rehnquist. And our dear friend Nat Lewin, one of the greatest lawyers in American history, got that decision reversed. He reversed the Supreme Court decision. How do you get a Supreme Court decision reversed? He got Congress to pass a statute which permitted um, Amer uh, uh, federal officials to wear a uh, yarmulke in the courtroom. Uh -huh. So, you know, you can fight back. You can even fight back against bigotry by the Supreme Court. And that opinion by the Supreme Court had elements of bigotry in it. Interestingly, in this case, uh, I saw that Ilan Omar wrote a piece, uh, a tweet supporting my uh, right to wear the yarmulke. I assume she hadn't read anything I'd written about her in the past uh, and <laughs> her and that what or, I call or, the hate or squad. I'd written about Disney. her, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so just one final question on this, and then we'll get back to the merits. And that is, <clears throat> you, uh, we missed you on Friday late afternoon and Saturday. Uh, your absence was very much noted. And some people raised questions about why couldn't you have stayed near the Capitol, walked to the Capitol, not used pen or pencil, and simply appeared and made your brilliant argument on Friday night or Saturday. Yeah, I, I'm very sorry that I missed the question and answer period because there were some real opportunities for those questions that I, I think were missed. But um, And I, I would have loved to have given the closing argument, and the president made clear he wanted me to have that kind of role in the case. I, I weighed all of those things, and I could have maybe put aside the microphone and that sort of thing. But I thought that the, the, what it would have reflected was that I was still treating it as if it were another workday. And I thought that for those people who subscribe to that kind of religious observance, it was an important statement to make to not, especially in the spirit of the Sabbath, uh, to not just show up like it was a regular day. And I have to say that since, since that happened, I've heard from people all around the world that it's made, it's, they feel it's made their job a little bit easier. People, somebody wrote me works at Goldman Sachs said, you know, I've always wrestled what to do, what to do about Shabbos and so on. I feel more comfortable now that someone in a setting like this, the impeachment of the trial of the president of the United States, made that decision and stood firm on it. So I'm glad I made that decision. On the other hand, I missed the Look, opportunity of a lifetime, you know, to give a closing argument there. But. You're going to go down in history as the Sandy Koufax <laughs> of the legal profession. I grew up with Sandy Koufax. He lived uh just down the block from me. His father was a lawyer, Irving Koufax. And Sandy, of course, wouldn't pitch in game one of the World Series. And in fact, and had Don Drysdale pitch instead of him. Not a bad choice. Um, but he'll always be remembered more for what he didn't do than for what he did do. And you'll be remembered both for what you did do and what you didn't do. Your brilliant defense of uh, the former president, your brilliant defense of the Constitution, and your defense of Jewish culture, Jewish values, and Jewish religion. It's a, it's a great legacy. Your family should be extremely, extremely proud of you. And to the extent that you've lost friends or associates or civil liberties, acquaintances, um, you did the right thing. And uh, you always have me supporting you and defending you. And if you ever, as you know, I've made an offer, a public offer, if any lawyer is subject to any kind of official sanction because of what they did in the defense of the Constitution, I'll be there for them. I'll represent them. I'll help them. I'll write affidavits on their behalf. I hope it won't be necessary in your case. Do you have any final comments, statements, or anything you want to leave us with uh, And uh, before I express my great appreciation? I don't think so. I, I, you know, I, I uh, wasn't sure I could speak, frankly, after you just said those words for us. For me to hear that from Alan Dershowitz uh, means a great deal. All I would say is uh, this was a very interesting experience for me. I was very impressed with how gracious President Trump was and the support that he gave to me at all times, um, undeservedly, but that he, uh, uh, that he gave to me. This process is very important. I'm sorry that it ever happened. It never should have happened. I think it was bad for the American right. people. I think it was antithetical to these ideas of healing and unity and accountability. I think it's anathema to the American people to suggest that any legal proceeding, let alone a proceeding involving the institution of the presidency should be conducted this way, a snap impeachment, um, a sham trial with a judge who, a uh, fine person, Senator Leahy. But understand, on January 13th, he issued a press release saying everyone must convict Donald Trump, the Republicans and the Democrats, finding him guilty 
an Alice in Wonderland fashion before hearing the evidence and then sitting as a juror on the case. And on January 27th, taking an oath of office since the 1800s, this oath says, I swear to be an impartial juror in the case. This is not a sham, but it turned out to be a sham. The American people deserve, deserve much better than that. Um, anyway, I'm glad it's behind us. I think, frankly, that President Trump's going to get a great deal of momentum from this acquittal. I think that those videos had an impact. I know that they did on the Republican senators. They felt that finally someone had stood up for them. I was glad to do that just to expose the double standard and the hypocrisy that you expose every day of your life. Thank you very much, though, for having me. Hey, it's been great having you on. I only disagree with one word you said. Uh, you said undeserved. Uh, it was very much deserved. The praise you got, the credit you got, you were a credit to the legal profession, to civil libertarians, to our common religious heritage. And I'm proud to uh, consider myself a friend and a colleague of yours. And thank you so much for being on the show. And if you ever want to come back and you have another case that you want to talk about sometime in the future, you're always welcome on The Der Show. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank you very much. For those of you who don't understand my last word, Shabbat shalom, it just means have a good Sabbath. And I wish a good Sabbath, a good Sunday to every one of my listeners, no matter what your religious background may be. Please keep calling in to The Der Show. We're going to have more guests like David Schoen. But mostly, I want to rely on you. You're the wits from the Dirt Show. And please subscribe, tell your friends, and call the Dirt Show. An important part of the Dirt Show is your voice, your questions, your comments. Please call 24 7. The number is 216 710 0050. Keep your comments short and to the point. Again, the number for you to call. 24-7 is 216-710-0050. Hard questions, criticisms, everything's fine. Just keep your questions short, and I'll answer them all on The Dirt Show. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.